To our text this morning, the opening verses of the Gospel of Luke, which I'd like to read with you again, and I invite you to keep them open as well as we consider God's Word together this morning. Luke 1, verses 1 through 4. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the Word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. This is the word of God. And may he bless also the proclamation of God's word this morning. Beloved in Christ Jesus, our Lord, I'm going to begin this morning with a series of really personal questions that thankfully you don't need to answer, uh, but maybe you can think about them as you listen this morning and reflect on them also after this service and perhaps into the, into the week. How is your faith, is the question I want you to consider. And do you ever struggle, in particular, do you ever struggle with doubt or with lack of assurance? Are there moments in which your faith wavers? I think if we are honest with ourselves, we will all admit that there are moments and seasons in our life in which our faith is strong, and then there are seasons of our life in which our faith is weak. Or perhaps you are watching this morning and you consider yourself to be a skeptic. That is, somebody who questions as a matter of character or personality. Someone once described doubt as a mosquito that buzzes around the edges of our faith. And I think that's a particularly appropriate metaphor and particularly appropriate as I come back to Ontario and experience the mosquitoes again um, this past summer. That is something that is there and bothersome and niggling and annoying and you just can't seem to get rid of it. And so the question this morning is, are you bothered by the mosquitoes, as far as your faith is concerned? Well, I have good news for you this morning, literally good news. The Gospel of of Luke, I think in some respects, is particularly addressed to those who have these mosquitoes buzzing at the edges of their faith. Luke's audience are those who are struggling with lack of assurance, who desire and long for greater certainty. And he makes that absolutely clear in his opening verses. I have to confess, actually, that I almost didn't preach on this passage when I began my series in the Gospel of Luke in in Langley. This was about a year ago. Uh, As I sat down, I figured I would just continue on after the Christmas story, since we had just been through Christmas, and that we would just continue on after there. But then as soon as I sat down to read through Luke's Gospel and read these opening verses, realized that they are crucial for setting the stage. And perhaps as you've read Luke's Gospel before, these are words that you sort of glaze over and pass over en route to more exciting narratives. But here's where Luke sets the stage for his gospel. It's where he gives us a clue as to the purpose of his gospel. In in many respects, it's a very very important opening phrase. You see, in the ancient world, in particular, when Luke first started writing, they were writing on scrolls. You think of a, of a scroll, and perhaps some of the kids who are watching this morning have made scrolls before. You take the outside of a pa- paper and you roll it into the middle. You think of a scroll, there's no place to put a, a, a table of contents or a, a title page or anything like that, or even a little blurb. So the first sentence is a very important point where the writer outlines for the readers, this is what we're all about. This is what you can expect in the pages ahead which means it's very important to begin as a, as a laying of the foundation of the framework for Luke's gospel. And so I want to suggest that my theme for you this morning, which is know Jesus with certainty, is not just a theme for these opening verses, but a theme for Luke's gospel as a whole. He wants, as we read through the gospel, and perhaps it's time for you to take Luke's gospel again and, and read it through, he wants you to be more and more convinced of the truth of the gospel. He wants you to know Jesus with certainty. But I'll get back to that a little bit later. Let's begin from the very beginning. Uh, Luke begins with this word in the ESV, which we're using this morning, in as much. In as much. And that tells us something actually right off the bat. I wonder how many of you have used the word in as much ever, perhaps, in your life. Uh, The only reason I've used it has been because I've been preaching this sermon um, a few times in in the area. It tells us something. Of course, Luke was writing in Greek, so he didn't write the word in as much. But the English word reflects well what the Greek says, and that that is that Luke is going to write something that is academic. He's going to write something that is scholarly. In fact, Luke is a scholar. He's a historian. Paul tells us in one of his letters, Colossians, he tells us that Luke is a medical doctor, actually. He's got specific gifts and specific, specific skills and specific interests, 
that draw him to writing this, this uh, account of Jesus' life. And so he's going to give us a particular kind of writing. And, and that ought to shape the way that we approach Luke's writing as well. He doesn't begin, as some of you may be familiar, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, which would be an entirely different kind of story. And we would expect something much different. Instead, he comes to us with this introduction. He says, listen, I'm going to give you an academic account, a scholarly account of things that really happened. If this is history. And as much as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, and whoa, that's all very good if you're an academic. But what Luke, what's Luke saying exactly? He's saying that people have been compiling narratives, have been writing stories down. And they've been writing th- about things that have been accomplished among us. And that language he uses there of accomplished among us ought to alert us to the fact he's not just talking about some random events that have happened. He's talking about the things that God has been doing. This is code language for, for fulfillment, that God is speaking to him. God is giving Luke insight into what God has been busy with these last years, that what has happened in, this, in the first century in Judea is not just a random series of events, but God is bringing all of history to its culmination and climax here. What we've got in Luke is the fulfillment of God's story and God's purposes and God's plans. So according to Luke, these people have been writing down narratives, have been writing stories. So why is he telling us this? Well, if we jump down to verse 3, he tells us, It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. So Luke says, well, I'm going to give you an account too. Not because the other ones are not valuable or good, but he's going to give his own perspective. It's a wonderful thing, actually, that we have four Gospels. And they each give their own perspective, their own portrait of Christ, all true, um, but with their own contributions. And Luke says, my contribution actually is that I'm going to write an orderly account for you, Theophilus. And if you know anything about Luke's gospel, you'll know that he came through on his, on his promise. It's especially orderly. Just think of the Christmas account, which will be familiar to many of you. In fact, maybe you can recite some version of it um, in your mind, or maybe it's a combination of versions because you've heard so many over the years. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And it, it's this orderly way he gives us the details. We can pin down the dates. We can pin down who's in charge at a certain point. And that's not the only moment that Luke does this. But it's not just that he's going to give us these dates and details so that we can pin down when exactly things happen. He also wants us to know what's the right perspective on things. What is the right understanding of these events that happened? Why is it so significant what happened to Jesus Christ? Why should we care in the 21st century about these things that happened 2,000 years ago in in far off Jerusalem and, and Galilee? And that's clear from what he tells us about how he went about writing his account. And this is verse two, where he says, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. He gives us insight into his method, you could say, as a historian. He's got sources. He didn't just block off some time, go to his office, and start to type out this story in, in, in his, on his own, on his lonesome. He's got sources. He went out, and he tracked down eyewitnesses of what happened. You have to picture Luke as he's writing his gospel, going to places and interviewing people and sitting down for coffee with Zechariah and Elizabeth and saying, well, tell me what happened in that moment, right? That, that this account that he gives us of Zechariah and Elizabeth is not something that he hasn't already tested himself, that he's gone out and, and done the hard work of tracking down the people whose stories he's going to tell. And perhaps he sat down with some soldiers who were there when Jesus was crucified. Perhaps he tracked down some of the Pharisees and forced them to tell him something of what they experienced. He spent a lot of time with what he calls ministers of the word. And actually, eyewitnesses and ministers of the word describe in particular one group of people, that is the apostles. People who are called to be ministers of the word, and we're very familiar, many of us, or most of us, with the word ministers, and so we don't understand the significance of it, perhaps, anymore. The word ministers means servants, servants of the word. And that is people who were standing under the word rather than over the word. People who submitted their lives to the word rather than those who controlled or, or dictated the content of the word. Remember my dad often signs off on his, at the end of his name VDM, which stands for the Latin Verbi Dei Minister, Minister of the Word. I used to think it was like a status thing. 
like you write Esquire after your name or something like that. But when we understand it truly, it's, it's a word of, of humility. To say, I'm a, I'm a servant of the word. And that's what pastors are as well. And so Luke says, I went to these apostles. And they simply transmitted faithfully the word of God to me. That's what, their, that's what their concern was. Not their own message, not their own convictions, their own opinions. But he gave them the word of God. And then he gives us this very interesting clue about who he's writing to. He says he's writing to most excellent Theophilus, which probably means he was a wealthy nobleman. Perhaps he's the one who, who supported Luke as he wrote this gospel. But at the same time, there's something very interesting about this name, if you know Greek, like your pastor Tony does. It means lover of God it, or beloved of God. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I think there really was a man named Theophilus in the first century. But I don't think it's a coincidence that God had Luke write a message to this particular man. He's speaking not just to Theophilus in the first century. He's speaking to all those who are beloved of God. Luke's gospel is not just a 2,000-year-old document. It's, it's written for us. It speaks to us today. He's writing for you and for me. This is God's word to us. The question remains, why Luke's gospel, really? What's Luke's main aim? And here's where we get to the point of the sermon, and here's where we get to the point of the gospel as well. Luke tells us at the very end there, this is verse 4, why am I writing these things down? That you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. That you may have certainty. And in the Greek, that's the very last, you're getting a lot of Greek this morning. In the Greek, that's the very last word of verse 4. He saves it to the very end. Before he launches into the narrative, he leaves it to the very end. He says, I want you to have certainty. He wants us to know Jesus with certainty. Luke wants us to grow in the assurance of faith. Because we need to know. We need to know that these things are true. We need to know that Jesus was, in fact, born of the Virgin Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit. That he lived and he suffered and he died. That he was raised from the dead. That he ascended to heaven. That he is at the Father's right hand. That this is true. This isn't just pie in the sky or some kind of mythical story, but that this is historical fact. We need to know these things with certainty. The Apostle Paul tells us in in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, listen, if the resurrection isn't true, then then you're wasting your time and it's all meaningless. If it isn't a historical fact, then then forget about it. Then the Christian life is, is not worth living. So we need to know that these things are true. When I was preparing this sermon about a year ago, I happened to pick up a book that somebody in the congregation had given to our oldest son, Gabriel. It was a, an apologetics book, a book defending the, the gospel. The first thing I was coming down from my, from my study and saw it sitting on the counter and picked it up, the first chapter I opened to providentially was a chapter on Luke's writings. And the authors of this book lo- um, tell the story of how scholars love to poke holes in, in Luke's history. And they love to, ex- to suggest that he's not a trustworthy historian. For example, Luke also wrote the book of Acts. Um, And in the book of Acts, he calls these city officials in the city of Thessalonica, he calls them politarchs. You don't need to remember that, but he calls them politarchs. Uh, Archaeologists and historians had never heard this phrase before, and so they pointed to Luke's writings and said, well, Luke can't be trusted. There's no such thing as a politarch in the first century in Thessalonica, so you can't trust Luke's writings here. Ergo, you can't trust Luke's writings whatsoever. But in the time after that, dozens of inscriptions have been discovered from that very region of the world, testifying to the presence of politarchs in Thessalonica during this time, and so Luke's accuracy has been vindicated. It reminds me of the way that Luke describes these ministers of the word, doesn't it? That is, that is those who, who submit themselves to the word, and so often scholars and academics like to imagine that they are those who stand over the word. In particular, our day, in a day of modernism and postmodernism, to say that I can dictate what is true in God's word, that I, that I can be the arbiter of what is true. I can discover uh, for myself what I'll accept and what I don't accept. It's not just scholars, is it? Perhaps you've had conversations yourself with people who love to point out inconsistencies or what they perceive as inconsistencies and co- contradictions in the word of God. Or maybe that's where you're at yourself. Let me say this very carefully and kindly. There's a certain arrogance to that approach to Scripture because it's a way of elevating ourselves to, in a sense, God's position to say that we will be the ones who dictate what is true and what is not true. You're making yourself the ultimate authority over God's Word rather than being a servant of the Word. 
Now, one thing we can do, of course, is defend Luke's accuracy, which is what those apologists did, and that's important work in the church. But usually the problem is not a problem with the head, it's a problem with the heart, isn't it? It's a, it's a heart that is unwilling to submit. It's a heart that's unwilling to give authority to God himself. But it would be a mistake if I were to leave you with the impression that Luke's main concern is simply that we get our facts straight. That he's just concerned that you know what happened in detail. That's, that's a mistake. He, instead, he wants you to have certainty about what this all means. Why should I care, actually, that all these things happened in the first century? He wants us to know the significance of these things. He wants you to be more and more certain of the fact that if you believe in this Jesus Christ, that his life and death are your salvation. That is, if you believe in him, then that, that wonderful truth that we heard already, that he who knew no sin becomes sin, and we receive the righteousness of God. That these events are not just significant in their time, but they're significant for all time. You see, Luke wrote this gospel for people who need to believe that Jesus is the only way of salvation. So he's writing for people who, who may see Jesus as an interesting teacher or as a good man. He's writing for people who haven't yet understood that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God who came into this world to save it and to redeem it. He's writing for anyone listening this morning who has not yet found refuge in Jesus Christ from the coming wrath of God against sin. But he's also writing for those who know that Jesus is the Christ, that is believers like Theophilus, but who somehow want to grow in certainty who want to grow in assurance, who long to be filled with greater certainty that all these things are true, not just in a general sense, but in in a personal sense, that these things are true for me. He's writing for believers like you and me. I haven't forced you to give me your answer yet, but I suspect you're like me. That is, you want to grow in assurance of faith. Because we need to know. We need to grow in our certainty. The life of a Christian is a, is a progressive journey of growth, and, and certainty is one of those things we can grow in. You see, too often we're like Zechariah. I don't think it's, for, it's, it's not for nothing that Luke includes this story of Zechariah immediately after he says these things. I think in some ways Zechariah serves as a paradigm or a, or a picture of the type of believer that Luke is trying to address. You see, Zechariah is given the, the good news, the gospel, isn't he? That's what Gabriel says to him. I stand in the presence of God and I sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news, he says, verse 19. Good news is gospel. And what what does Zechariah do? He fails to believe. He, He, in a sense, he looks at his wife's barrenness and he looks at the promises of God and he can't seem to see how the two could possibly match up. He can't believe that the many prayers that he and his wife have been offering up year after year after year are finally being answered. He can't see that God is bringing about the the coming of the Messiah either. And we're often not much different. That is, we look at the circumstances in our lives and we compare them to what God says in his word and we don't see how they could possibly match up. We fail to believe. Perhaps for you, it's a question of forgiveness. You know your sin all too well. You, you, you know the things in your past or perhaps things you're struggling in the present and you hear the gospel which says that these are forgiven you in Christ Jesus and you think it can't possibly be true. It can be true perhaps in a general sense and for other people, but for me, God cannot forgive uh, the sins that I've committed. And perhaps for others, it's more like the circumstances of Zechariah. There's something in your life that you've been praying for and praying for and longing for for many years and God doesn't appear to be hearing your prayers or answering your prayers. Or you look at the circumstances in your life and you see the hardship and the the sorrow and the heartache. And then you go to God's word and it says that he is a God of love and compassion. And you think, how could this possibly be true? Or you go to God's word and it says that God works all things for good of those who love him who are called according to his purpose. And you think, how can that possibly be true in my circumstances? And so we long for greater certainty We long to know more and more Christ, don't we? The certainty of the gospel in Jesus Christ. You see, too often we're like the disciples. This is the reality of the the believer. The disciples to whom Jesus said so many times, O you of little faith. Does that describe you in any way this morning? How is your faith? Does it lack a certain rootedness or a certain strong foundation? Or perhaps you're just bothered by the mosquitoes. 
these questions and these doubts they come up. Well, the Gospel of Luke was written for you. You see, you can trust Luke to tell you what is true and certain. Not because Luke was such a great historian, although he was that too, but because what Luke is giving us is the very Word of God. You see, Zechariah receives the Word of God ultimately from, from Gabriel's mouth. He says, I'm, I stand in the presence of God. I'm here to give you God's Word. Well, this is the Word of God. I got to teach um, canonics this past term. And uh, in canonics, you deal with how the church receives the Bible as scripture. And I'm in the New Testament, of course, so looking at the New Testament. And there's this wonderful moment or this wonderful place in Paul's letter to 1 Timothy, uh, letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy, where he says this. He gives us two quotations. He says, for the scripture says, then he gives us two quotations. He says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. And that's a quote from the Old Testament. And so, of course, Paul believes that to be scripture. There's a second quote. He says, the laborer deserves his wages. And that comes from the Gospel of Luke. That was like a, a wonderful revelation to me. Paul receives um, the, the Gospel of Luke and he knows it's God's word. And Paul is writing uh, a couple years, uh, maybe a decade at most, after Luke wrote his Gospel. In fact, they were companions on the ship. In fact, maybe Paul even saw Luke having conversations with people, doing his, his tracking down of eyewitnesses. And maybe they had conversations about it all as well. And he knew and he, he saw Luke writing down the gospel, and he knows this isn't just a a historian who's busy with his sources, this is the word of God. And so as we read God's word, we can never forget what the apostle Peter teaches us. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Luke spoke from God as he was carried along by the Holy Spirit. We do not have a word from man here, we have a word from God. God's hand and God's breath are all over the gospel of Luke. That's why we can have certainty when we go to Luke's gospel. Now, maybe for some of you, you don't question the doctrine of the inspiration of Scripture this morning. And and you hear many times from this pulpit, I imagine, um, this is the word of God, those words. But perhaps it's, it's stopped sinking in that what we have received here is the word of God. That God, the creator of all things, has spoken to us. And he's answered our deepest needs. And he's given us this word for assurance and certainty. Do you struggle with a lack of assurance? Do you want to grow in the certainty of faith? Well, God's word has the power to speak to us. God's word has the power to work that assurance and that certainty into our hearts. In a world which says there's no such thing as truth, in fact, you can have your truth and I can have my truth and they can disagree with each other, but that's all okay. We receive God's word as the absolute truth, truth of the capital T. And it's solid ground on which to stake our lives. When I was a pastor, it wasn't, wasn't uncommon for me to have conversations, especially with the young people, about certain doctrines that they were struggling with. And perhaps it's the same here. Well, I know it's the same because I used to teach catechism here as well. And I was, I was very thankful that, that we had this open environment where we could ask these questions and, and talk about them. Please don't ever stop asking questions if they're rumbling around in your heart and in your head. But the question I would always ask in response and the thing that we would wrestle to, together with is are we also testing our questions against the word of God as opposed to simply sitting in our room or going for a drive or going for a walk and just wondering about these things in our head? Are we submitting ourselves, placing ourselves under the word of God? If we can't wrap our minds around the reality of hell, Are we willing to submit ourselves to what God has said in his word? If you're struggling with the gender or sexuality issues that are facing the church, are we willing to go to God's word? And and then when we see things perhaps that we don't like, that we're willing to submit to it nonetheless. Are we willing to speak, to look to the truth? And as we read, that we read it together as church. right? That we don't just each come with our own private interpretation, but that we read together communally. Reading scripture is a communal activity. And then being willing to submit our limited and creaturely minds to what God has given us in his word. But of course, doubts and questions aren't just a head problem. They're often a heart problem, aren't they? In fact, perhaps more often and more deeply, they're a heart problem. Our hearts are weak and they're prone to wander. But God's word has the answer for that as well. Your feelings and your fears and your worries, and perhaps this is what we need the most in this time of uncertainty, and this time in which we are losing loved ones. And we wonder, what, what is God doing in the world at this time? And what is his purpose with all of this? 
Well, then we too need to go back to God's word and and see truth. And in particular, we come to the gospel and we see all of it revealed most clearly in the person of Jesus Christ. You see, it's all revealed most clearly in the the life and the suffering and the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ that God is busy in this world and he is redeeming all things. He's still accomplishing things in and through his church. You see, too often when we wrestle with doubts and weakness of faith, our answer is to look to ourselves. And we wonder if we have enough faith, if we trust enough. And perhaps that's where you're at. Is my faith strong enough? That question. Is it strong enough for me to to be in the final day when Christ returns in the face of judgment? Was my faith strong enough? Or perhaps you are in the realm of worrying about your spiritual performance. And you wonder, am I good enough? Have I been obedient enough? Have I done enough? Do I measure up? Once spoke with an older lady in my congregation, and she was facing the, her imminent death, and, and the question on her heart was, am I a good Christian? Was I a good Christian? And I had to say to her, that's the wrong question to ask. You see, if we, if we continue to look at ourselves, if we continue to navel-gaze, we will never grow in assurance or certainty. We need to look outside of ourselves, and we need to look at Jesus Christ. You turn to the Word of God and you study the person and the work of Christ. You go to the Gospel of Luke and see how wonderfully he displays our our Savior. You see, we need to stop looking at ourselves and we need to start looking at Christ. As As we come to a close here, I want to share a story with you, something that's been very encouraging to me. It's a true story about a Southern Presbyterian minister named Robert Louis Dabney. Robert Louis Dabney, you, you can read his works. He was a pillar of the church, the Southern Presbyterian Church, um, staunch gospel preacher all of his life. But he found himself on his deathbed in 1890, and he, and he was struggling in that moment with doubt and lack of assurance. And, and this is a, something that is not uncommon, of course, for those whose death is, is pressing upon them, or when you're reminded of the reality of death and the certainty of death. And he found himself struggling. And so he wrote to his friend, a man named Vaughn, and he shared his struggles. And Vaughn wrote a letter in response that you can still find on the internet today. You can Google it after the service or, or just ask me for it. And he asked Dabney to imagine, he gave this, this story. Imagine a traveler coming to a bridge. And he comes to this bridge that crosses over a deep chasm, a deep canyon. It's the only way across and this traveler must get to the other side. What does the traveler do to determine whether or not he should trust this bridge, have confidence in this bridge to get him to the other side? How does he build his confidence, his certainty that this is the way to go? Well, the answer is obvious, isn't it? He goes to that bridge and he considers it from every angle. He looks at the the piers and the buttresses and the girders and whatever other parts of the bridge there happen to be. And he studies it intently to see if this is a solid and trustworthy bridge. What he doesn't do is stand there at the bridgehead, close his eyes, and wonder to himself and think, do I trust this bridge enough? Do I have enough confidence in this bridge to cross over? And if he wants more certainty, if his examination hasn't satisfied him, what's he going to do to build up that certainty and that confidence? Well, he's going to go back to the bridge and he's going to look at it some more from another angle. He's going to consider it again. And then Vaughn wrote this. He said, now, my dear old man, let your faith take care of itself for a while, and you just think of what you are allowed to trust in. Think of the master's power. Think of his love. Think of what he's done, his work. That blood of his is mightier than the sins of all the sinners that ever lived. Don't you think it will master yours? Zivan said, stop looking at yourself and stop looking to yourself and start looking at Jesus. The certainty of faith is the certainty of knowing Jesus. It's not your faith that saves you. It's your Savior who saves you. It's not about the strength of your Savior. It's not about the strength of your faith. It's about the strength of your Savior, isn't it? It doesn't matter how weak your hold on him is. What matters is that his hold on you is absolutely unbreakable. And so the answer to doubts and worries and fears and lack of assurance and lack of certainty is to look to Christ. It's to consider him in his word. It's to examine him and ask the question, not am I a strong enough believer, but is Jesus a strong enough savior for me? And the answer is he is eminently 
and his blood can satisfy the sins of an infinite number of people. And his power is infinite. And nothing will snatch us from his hand. And so we receive certainty from, from the Spirit of God who breathed this gospel out through Luke. And so read the scriptures. If you're struggling with lack of assurance today, perhaps start reading the gospel of Luke and look at Jesus there. And pray. Pray constantly. Pray for the Spirit every time you open God's Word. Pray for your pastor as he works on God's Word in the, in the study week to week. Pray as you come into the, this presence, in the presence of God and as you come into your living rooms and turn on to the live stream again. Pray for the Spirit to open your hearts and pray to Jesus. Pray this prayer. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Let's come to God in prayer. Our gracious and loving God, so often we are a people of weak faith. We doubt, we waver, we lack certainty. We come to you, Father, and we pray that you'd forgive us for our unbelief. Forgive us for not taking you at your word, for not trusting fully in your promises, for letting our hearts and our minds wander. Forgive us for failing to submit to the truth of your word, for thinking that our limited knowledge could be anything near your omniscience. And we thank you. Thank you for revealing your grace and your mercy, your compassion and your love. We thank you for, for your beloved son, Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins in his precious blood, a blood that is mightier than the sins of every sinner that has ever lived. Assure us, we pray. Give us greater certainty by his life and death, his resurrection and ascension. Assure us that you are for us and not against us. Give us the certainty of knowing Jesus. Work in us by the power of your Holy Spirit to renew and strengthen our faith, to give us a childlike trust so that we may live confidently as your children. Lord, we believe. Help us in our unbelief. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of response is also a hymn of confidence a hymn of confidence in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Let's sing together hymn 55, all stanzas.